Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to give um, just a few minutes for everybody to sign in. Uh, and we'll be starting in just a couple of minutes. And we'll give it at least one more minute and we'll start probably about 12.01, 12.02. Yeah, it looks like we've got about 22 people in. I think we were expecting around 70, so. Yes, sir. Give her just a minute. We're, we're expecting people from all over the Southeast, so it might take just a few minutes. All right, I think we should go ahead and roll as, yep. as other people can join in. We got about 38 in the... Yeah, we're at about 50% capacity, so let's go ahead and, and uh, light this candle. Uh, good afternoon and welcome. My name is James Taylor, and I am Swayzok Account Manager for the North uh, East Florida area. I cover uh, University of Florida and uh, Florida State University, as well as a host of other industries, such as paper mills and power plants. I have been with Swayzlock for 19 years now, next month, uh, and, uh, and I'm a University of Florida alum, graduated in 1998, so it was probably uh, before some of you guys were born. Uh, with us today, we have our field engineer, Mr. Ben Carr, who graduated from Southern Poly, which is now Kennesaw State, with a mechanical engineering degree. Ben has worked as an account manager for Swayzlock, Georgia from 1996 to 2002 and returned as regional field engineer in July of 2018. Uh, in the 16 years between roles at Swayzlock, Ben is a director of STEM Academy at a local high school and taught AP physics, CAD, and a variety of other math classes. Since his return, Ben has served as, a custom, uh, as our customer service rep by providing technical support, product selection, field evaluation services, and custom solutions. Today, we're gonna to be running through regulator selection and safe and, and all the safety concerns involved in that. We have a host of colleges joining us from Clemson to Georgia Tech and the University of Florida. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ben Carr. All right, thank you, James. Um, just to, as we go through this, if you guys have questions, if you use the Q&A feature of the Zoom and you can uh, type a question there and, and James will um, interrupt me and, and help me moderate that. Uh, and I'll have a few places I pause uh, specifically for questions. So feel free to put those in the, in the uh, Q&A section of that. I'm gonna go ahead and just turn off my video so you all don't have to look at me this whole time. And uh, we can uh, focus on focus on the topic at hand. So we are gonna be talking about safe regulator selection. Uh, this is presented by Swayjock, Georgia, Jacksonville, and South Carolina. We are uh, one distributor representing that entire area. Um, so uh, we are your point of contact for Swayjock products. So, the first thing I want to do is talk about basic regulator types. There are others. Uh, I'll mention them later in it, but there are two main types. These are the most familiar where we're talking about pressure reducing regulators or back pressure regulators. And in this presentation, I'm only going to focus on pressure reducing regulators. If you have questions about back pressure regulators, we can also uh, take a look at that uh, specifically by question. But a pressure reducing regulator is designed to take a high upstream pressure and reduce it down to your process uh, pressure that you need. And so it kind of as the name suggests, that's its job. And that's all its job is to do is to reduce the pressure. A back pressure regulator works basically the opposite direction. It takes your process pressure and tries to maintain that pressure. Again, uh, that is dependent on the supply but it is designed just to vent off excess pressure as it goes. Uh, it's kind of like a glorified relief valve, but it's gonna be much more accurate than just your standard relief valve and allow you to maintain a, a tighter control on that. So again, I'm gonna be talking about pressure reducing regulators, but I at least wanted to mention back pressure regulators here at the beginning. So first we'll cover some do's and don'ts, and I'll start with the don'ts and give you a do for each one of those don'ts. So first, don't use a regulator as a shutoff. They are not designed to do that. Their seats are not designed to completely shut off. They are designed again to control pressure. So we always want to make sure we do use an upstream shutoff valve, something above the regulator to control the 
uh, shut off the turning on and off of the system. Now, if you're using something temporarily and you just shut off downstream, that's fine. But if we're going away overnight, we wanna make sure that we're shutting it off upstream of the regulator. That's gonna prevent us from having safety issues that we'll address in a little bit. Don't use a regulator as a, to control flow. Again, they're designed to control pressure, not flow. As it tries to open to correctly control the pressure, uh, its CV is going to vary. So we do wanna use some kind of downstream flow control, either a flow controller with a needle valve built into it or just a needle valve if that's sufficient, or some of you in your laboratories may be using even a mass flow controller to give you really precise measurements of the flow um, as you are uh, working on your experiment. Don't just select an off-the-shelf regulator or a used regulator. Um, off-the-shelf regulator is not gonna be specific to your application. It's not gonna give you the performance or the safe and reliable operation that you are expecting from it. Um, be really careful about using a used regulator. I know you guys have a lot of experiments that have been done in the past and you're reusing equipment. You really need to know about that regulator before you use it. So contact the manufacturer, reach out and consult with the manufacturer about what that regulator was designed for. Don't rely on just the pressure gauges that are in it to tell you what the inlet pressure is in the control range. Take the part number, or if it's etched on the regulator, make sure you've got the right thing. The other concern, and it's a real safety concern uh, for used regulators, is you don't always know what that regulator was used for in the past. So it may have been used with some kind of chemical that could react with what you're currently trying to do, or just even have other contaminants in it that would make uh, your experiment not as, uh, as expected. Don't expose the regulator to particulate. This goes for before installation, if you're working in a dirty area, and after installation, making sure that the tubing and other connections that you made were clean uh, so that we don't damage the regulator. So clean the system and use filters as needed. Now, if you're using a swage lock regulator, it does come with a small filter on the inlet but that is for gas use only. It must be removed if you are using liquid, using it for liquid service. So there I would consider a filter um, that is separate from the filter that would be in the regulator installed before it. And we'll take a closer look at why we want to make sure we have those items available. Don't pressurize the system quickly. Correct. Pressurizing the system really quickly can damage the diaphragm or other components of the regulator. So we wanna make sure that we're using a slow opening valve. Now, if your regulator is directly on a cylinder, again, you won't run into that issue because cylinder valves are slow opening. You have to turn them multiple times to get it to open. But if you're working downstream, maybe it's off of a header or, um, and pulling gas from somewhere else, Try to avoid using a quick opening valve like a ball valve that might uh, accidentally slam gas into that regulator, damage the diaphragm. Uh, for some gases like oxygen, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, for some gases like oxygen, we wanna be careful to not produce adiabatic compression, which would cause heating and potential for a kindling chain to ignite and cause a fire in your lab. Again, don't size a regulator by CV. The CV given for regulators is when it is fully open. It is not its normal operating CV. So if you use that, you are not gonna get the flow that you expect through it. So do size it using a regula uh, regulator flow curve. Um, and if you're taking a look at those and they seem a little confusing, again, reach out to your uh, regulator manufacturer, they can help you select the correct one for your application. And later we'll take a look at a bunch of questions we're gonna ask if you call up and ask for a regulator. And it's not just to nitpick your system, it's to make sure we get you one that functions the way you want to and have safe operation with it. A couple more do's 
do make sure you size the gauges correctly. If you are expecting an output or an outlet pressure of 100 PSI, don't put a 100 PSI gauge in it. That will put the gauge at its maximum reading. It distorts the board on tube, which means that it will not read correctly in the future. And if you ever have any issue, it ca could cause a safety issue as well. So make sure that you're sizing your gauge so that it reads in the middle. So for a 100 PSI system, we would want to have at least a 200 PSI gauge in there. So we're reading in that middle third section of the gauge dial. And then lastly, make sure you're using compatible materials. Depending on the gases you have, they may react with different O-rings or seat materials. Um, if you're using oxygen, we want to make sure we're using a brass regulator and that is properly cleaned to the ASTM G93 standards for oxygen service. So there's a lot of issues that you want to make sure that you are looking at and making sure you pick the correct materials for your application. And when you just ask for something off the shelf or you just say, I just need a regulator and don't give us really much more information, it's hard for us to determine that. Or again, if you encounter a used regulator and you decide you're gonna put that in your system, we want to really make sure we know the history and the type and function of that regulator. So let's take a quick look at the basic theory for pressure reducing regulators. It breaks down into basically three main elements, the loading element, which consists of the range spring in this case, that spring could be replaced by other gases for a dome loaded regulator, but it's still gonna be called the loading element. We have the sensing element, which is the diaphragm, and then the control element that controls the flow of gas across that seat and gives you the correct outlet pressure. So if we're looking at regulators, they operate off of balance of forces. We have our loading force downward from the spring in this case, and then we have an upward force from the inlet spring, that arrow moved in there, but that's gonna be this little spring down here on the poppet. We have an outlet pressure force that is acting over the large surface area of the diaphragm. The larger that diaphragm, generally speaking, the more precise that regulator will be. And then we also have the inlet force, which is operating over a relatively small surface area. So our Three upward forces have to balance out with our one downward force from the loading spring. So we end up with an equation that looks something like this. Well, our inlet spring force and our inlet pressure force are relatively constant. We will talk about some exceptions to that as we go through, but um, they're relatively constant. So if I turn the handle of the regulator clockwise, in other words, tightening it down, kind of like I'm shutting off a valve. And this is something we really want to pay attention to. We're actually increasing the outlet pressure in this case instead of decreasing it. So we're tightening it down and we're not closing it off at that point. We are actually increasing the pressure. And the reason for that is as we squeeze that spring, our loading force goes up. And like I mentioned, if our inlet spring force and our inlet pressure force are relatively constant, the only thing that can change is the outlet pressure force has to rise as well. So it's opposite of using a valve. As you tighten that handle down, you're increasing your system pressure and you need to be aware of that. If you turn it counterclockwise, like you would be for opening a valve, you're gonna decrease the system pressure, assuming that regulator is vented. Um, if you have a regulator that is not self-vented, then that system pressure is not going to decrease when you start to uh, crank that handle back counterclockwise. It will only decrease once you start to use gas, and then you may actually have to readjust your setting. So be aware of that. Vented regulators uh, will allow you to decrease the pressure up and down. James, I see two hands raised. Uh, is there any questions in the Q&A or I do not have any right now. Okay, okay. But if anybody has a question and, and, and they want to type it in, I can read it off. Yeah, perfect. Okay. All right, so 
when we look at regulator performance, and again, this does affect safety, we, the first thing we're going to encounter is this lockup range. And this is the first zone, what we call it here on the regulator flow curve. So this is a simplified flow curve. It's not going to be what you see when you look at a catalog. Uh, we'll look at a couple of those later. But this lockup zone, you see a steep rise in pressure as flow goes to zero. If your regulator is sized correctly, this should only be about a 5 to 10 PSI rise. But if you have something that is uh, incorrectly sized, this can be a significant rise, and that can affect downstream components. So if your downstream components aren't rated above, let's say, 50 PSI, and you have an improperly sized regulator, and you shut that regulator off or shut the system off so the flow goes to zero, you may see a pressure rise that would actually be as much as 50 or 60 PSI and it could damage your components downstream, but worse yet, it may cause a leak, um, which would expose you possibly to hazardous gases or hazardous materials if there's not a proper ventilation system in place. So please make sure that you are sizing your regulator correctly to avoid having a significant pressure rise in the system when your uh, flow goes to zero. The next one is, is a little bit less of a safety concern. It's called droop, and it's what happens in this second zone, we call it, where that's the normal operating range of the regulator. So when we look at this zone, it's gonna occur for all regulators. It doesn't matter who manufactures them. We can flatten it out. There are some techniques, but obviously it costs a little bit more to uh, flatten that curve out. But if you have a process that maybe has a lot of varied flow, but it's very critical that you maintain a constant pressure, you may need to look at using a different type of regulator. So when we look at droop, I'm gonna click through a few slides here and, and try to explain what's happening. As I click, I want you to really focus in on this spring and what's happening with this loading spring. So as I go through, you can see that that loading spring elongated. I'm gonna back up again just so you can see it again. So as I go through, you see that loading spring elongating. And so that's in response to an increased flow on the outlet side. So as it elongates, if we know anything about springs, that loading force actually goes down. As that spring gets longer, it's not able to apply as much force down on the diaphragm, which means if that loading force is dropping, my outlet pressure is also going to drop. So if it's really critical to my application that I maintain a constant pressure, I have to be aware of that and make sure I do select the right kind of regulator. And it can be a safety concern if we've got something that maybe is supplying gas to a laser or uh, some other device that needs to be shielded from atmosphere, uh, it can create an area where you might have uh, room for uh, a fire or exposure to something that shouldn't be there. So we want to be sure that we're selecting a regulator that is going to perform within the flow characteristics we require. So here's droop in the simplest form. If I know I'm gonna have a particular flow and I know I need a particular pressure, I can set my regulator and pretty much expect it to perform at that point in space. But typically we're dealing with systems where we have a varied flow range. And what we'd really like is that nice flat, always holding the same pressure. Again, you can achieve that within a certain range. It just costs a little bit more to be able to do that. But with your typical regulator, if I'm looking at this flow curve and I slide it down and I actually set my pressure here at the beginning, my lowest flow range, I'm going to expect that I'm going to see some drop off in pressure by the time it reaches its maximum flow. The same could be said if I set it at my maximum flow, then as my flow decreases, I'm going to see a rise in pressure. And again, I need to be aware of all of these situations and I need to be able to make sure my regulators can perform safely in that range. If we set it even worse, 
in a static position. So I've got my system shut off downstream, nothing's happening or very little is happening. And I set it down here in this low lockup range. When I turn on my system, I'm gonna see much lower pressures than I expect. And I'm gonna to have to go back and adjust my regulator. Again, may not be a big deal if this is a point of use regulator right there at your bench where you can adjust it, but it is something that you need to be aware of when you're selecting your regulator. And the last thing we can compromise, but we will see some of that droop effect, either a rise in pressure at low flow or a, a decrease in pressure at the high flow. All right, any questions so far? Again, feel free to use that Q&A box uh, if you have something uh, that you wanna ask for the group and, and if you're uncomfortable uh, typing it in there, you can put it in as anonymous as well. All right, choked flow. Choked flow occurs in this third range of our uh, regulator flow curve and choked flow occurs down here, you see a steep, significant drop off in pressure. Again, this could be critical to your uh, experiment, uh, whether from a safety standpoint or just from actually getting the result that you were expecting. So you have to be aware of your flow curves. Anytime I go and look at one of these flow curves in the catalog, this is showing uh, two different regulators with three different inlet pressures. And each one of these has this choked flow piece down here at the end where it's gonna drop off significantly in your pressure. So what's happened here is that the regulator has opened to its full open position. And this is that CV I was talking about. It's acting only as an orifice at this point. It is not controlling your pressure. If uh, your inlet pressure drops off, you're gonna see a decrease in your outlet pressure. Uh, you could also see a little bit of rise there, but you are gonna, it's not gonna be able to supply the gas or fluid that you need through it. It's just acting as a restricting orifice. And that CV is its maximum flow rate that it can produce, not the normal operation. So we want our regulator to operate in this middle range where we're flattest in our flow curve. We want to avoid the top five to 10% and the bottom five to 10%. And again, call us, call your regulator manufacturer. We can help you select one that will work in that optimal range and give you safe, reliable uh, performance. I'm going to cover supply pressure effect uh, really quickly. Sometimes it's called inlet dependency. So as that inlet pressure changes, so if the inlet pressure drops, we would expect uh, the outlet pressure to also drop, but that's not really what happens in a regulator. If our inlet pressure drops, we're actually gonna see a rise in outlet pressure. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. And vice versa, if the inlet pressure goes up, then our outlet pressure is gonna go down. So this occurs when you're talking about using a cylinder, and it's starting to empty out, or maybe you just replaced an empty cylinder with a full cylinder, you need to be aware of that. So if you replace an empty cylinder, obviously that inlet pressure is gonna go up, your outlet pressure is gonna be lower when you turn that system back on. And it works based on the balance of forces equation again. We'll take a, a walk through of that. So my spring force, is constant or constant because I'm not adjusting it in this case. <clears throat> my inlet spring force is gonna be relatively constant. My outlet pressure force is gonna be one of the variables that's gonna change and my inlet pressure is dropping here. So we're no longer holding that inlet pressure constant. So F2 and F1 are constant. As the inlet pressure F4 drops, then F3 will have to increase in order to balance out that equation. Again, this, the pink arrows here, my inlet pressure is going down. So in order to balance out my loading spring, which is constant, my uh, outlet pressure F3 will have to increase. So if we're looking at your typical system, you got a 3,600 PSI cylinder over here on this side, you've got your regulator set to 50. 
this is a 1% supply pressure effect regulator. It's actually pretty good. Uh, you can sometimes see regulators that have as much as um, 5% or even 10% um, supply pressure effects. So as my cylinder starts to empty out, it's depleted. I have a delta P, a pressure drop of 1,000 PSI. 1% 1 of that difference is going to end up on the outlet. So I had a 1,000 PSI drop at 1% my outlet is gonna increase 10 PSI. If my drop had been 2000 PSI, I would see a 20 PSI rise on the outlet side of that gauge. And this is for a 1% supply pressure effect regulator. As I mentioned, sometimes you will see supply pressure effects as high as five to 10%. So you can imagine what that's doing to your system and again, if you have delicate or sensitive components downstream or components that are not rated for those higher pressures, you could end up with a leak, which could cause a safety hazard for those around you. And you might think, well, I'm not using a hazardous gas, I'm using nitrogen. Well, nitrogen, if you have this effect happen and starts to leak out of your system and you leave the lab sealed up overnight and you come back, uh, you've displaced the atmosphere from the from the lab potentially, and you have created a hazardous situation even with an inert gas. So again, be aware of these kind of effects, and they do play a key role in your uh, success of your experiments and safety of your lab. So one way we can combat supply pressure effect, and this is uh, something we do uh, consistently, either using two regulators or what we call a dual stage regulator. I am going to show you how it works with two regulators because it makes it a little bit easier to understand. But here we have our first regulator with a 3600 PSI inlet pressure. We have our second regulator with, well, sorry, a 3600 PSI inlet and a 500 PSI outlet which becomes the inlet pressure for our second regulator and the outlet pressure of our second regulator is set to 50 PSI. So as my cylinder is depleted, and in this case we depleted at 2000 PSI, so our delta P is 2000 uh, PSI, we will expect to see a 20 PSI increase between the two regulators. That's 1% of the difference or the pressure drop. If I take then 1% of that pressure increase on the outlet side of the second regulator, I only see a 0.2 PSI drop, or yes, drop in my system pressure. So I don't have to keep going back and adjusting as much when I have a dual stage or two regulators in line, allowing it to bring the pressure down and make that pressure a different differential pressure coming into the second regulator uh, smaller. So I can control my system a lot better. This is not always important. Again, if you're at a point of use where you have the regulator right next to you, a single regulator may be fine if we're not trying to tightly control those pressures. So again, you can see down 2000, up 20, down only 0.2 PSI. Here's just some images. This is two regulators. This is a, a piston style regulator to knock the high, high pressure down and then a dome loaded, very accurate uh, regulator for my final process pressure. Here I have that same system we were just looking at. This is called our KCY dual stage regulator. It's basically those two regulators built into one body. It's pretty cost effective and gives you that same level of accuracy that we were just looking at. Hey, Ben, we got a question. Sure. Uh, going back to uh, previous slides, or the question is why inlet P decreases is not equal to the outlet P increase based on the equation. So if we go back and look at the balance of pressure, balance of forces here, we've got a difference in surface area and that's what causes the percentage difference. So my difference in surface area, I, I have a large pressure drop from the inlet pressure 
over a very small surface area, which gives me, I only have to adjust a very small amount of pressure to balance that out since it's uh, over a larger surface area. I don't think I did a great job of explaining that, but I hope that sort of makes sense. So you're really talking about pressure drop? Yeah, the pressure drop here um, is, is, if we multiply that by the surface area, that gives us a force, right? Um, and in order to balance the force, let's say, let me give it some numbers. Um, let's say this is a thousand PSI pressure drop here. And the area at this seat is 1% of the area of the diaphragm, then I only have a 1% pressure change on the outlet pressure. Perfect. That. Yep, I got it. we got a thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, good. And so the larger we make that diaphragm, the lower that supply pressure effects goes. So in this case, you see this regulator with this very large diaphragm, that supply pressure effect becomes less. All right, creep is one of the most uh, possibly hazardous situations that you can have in your system. And creep is caused by a few things. One, a regulator is not a shutoff device. Sometimes the seats of these are very hard and they're gonna allow leakage past that seat all the time. A regulator is designed to control pressure while you have flow going through the system. Creep can also be caused by contamination. So we talked about cleaning your system, making sure when you install your tubing that you've properly deburred it and uh, clean that tubing out before it's installed, whether that's even just blowing it out with compressed air, or you may have a more critical cleaning situation where you need to make sure you're re removing all hydrocarbons and other, other possible contaminants to your system. Uh, but those particles uh, sometimes can be moving very fast in a high flow situation. It can damage the seat, can damage the poppet, it can cause misalignment of the poppet, it can jam the poppet. So then you end up with this situation where you're not, uh, you're no longer controlling the pressure downstream. So particularly on experiment, you might be running, you've got your regulator set, you got your 3000 PSI cylinder, you've got 100 PSI on the low side and you're done and you're gonna go home for the weekend or maybe for a holiday and you shut off this valve right here. And so, you've left your cylinder valve on or you've left your valve on from your header. And your worst case scenario is you got a little leakage by that seat and you start to uh, see a pressure rise downstream from that. And the worst case scenario, like I said, can be that you would actually experience the full cylinder pressure, the full bottle pressure downstream of that regulator. And you can imagine if you have sensitive equipment or laboratory tubing, that's going to result in leaks that are going to cause a safety hazard for you and the people you work with. So to avoid creep, we can do a few things. One thing that we can do is uh, make sure we've cleaned like we talked about or install a filter upstream. That's going to help prevent damage to the regulator. It's always a good idea to have some kind of relief system uh, in case there is creep, but that relief valve needs to be able to vent to a safe location. So whether it's in a vent hood or to uh, a roof stack, but it needs to be able to vent outside of your laboratory. So those are some safety concerns. But the simplest way to avoid creep, make sure it doesn't happen, always shut off upstream of your regulator. So if I shut off this valve, I don't have to worry about creep unless this valve is somehow leaking. So again, make sure you're shutting off your upstream valve. That's gonna be able to prevent uh, creep over the weekend or, or while you're gone. Uh, but you do need to protect your regulator, make sure it's controlling your pressure correctly uh, with filtration and cleaning your system. Any questions? All right, we're almost at the end and I'll, I'll open that up for full questions. So when you're selecting a regulator, some information you wanna make sure you're providing to your manufacturer and we will ask you for 
all of these things when you call in. Uh, we wanna make sure we know the function of your regulator. Are you actually gonna use a pressure reducing regulator or a back pressure regulator? You might see that I've got a couple of others that we didn't talk about, differential pressure, changeover, vaporizing, we can provide you with all those things as well. Uh, we need to know your inlet pressure. This is gonna be your maximum inlet pressure. So we match it to your supply um, from your system, whether it's coming off a header or coming off a cylinder. This helps us choose the right seat materials. If we're running relatively low inlet pressures, we can run a relatively soft seat and that's gonna do a pretty good job of sealing off when your system is not flowing. If you've got high inlet pressures, we need to use a hard seat. Make sure we don't damage it. Uh, pr pressure control range. What's the maximum pressure you're gonna need at your outlet? So we'll need to take a look at that and make sure we've matched it. We want that to be as close to your max operating pressure as possible. That's gonna give you your best performance and your safest operation. So if you need a 100 PSI at your outlet, we wanna give you a regulator that is as close to zero to 100 adjustment as possible. Doesn't mean you have to run it at 100, just we wanna make sure that the maximum outlet pressure is there and available. Uh, fourthly, we'll look at the flow requirements. We'll look at the flow curves if necessary. We'll do some calculations to make sure that we get you the right thing. We'll look at supply pressure effect to make sure that we're gonna keep you in range uh, as your cylinder or supply pressure drops down. Fifth, we'll look at system compatibility, make sure that we get you the right seat materials as far as compatible with the gases or chemicals you're using, the right kind of lubricants, um, and make sure that if necessary, we provide you with the right level of cleaning uh, for either high purity gases or oxygen. And then we'll look at system functionality. Do we wanna add options for venting and, or self-venting uh, do we need heating or um, any other uh, options for countering the Joule Thompson effect or gauges, CGA inlets, relief valves? We can, we can, again, provide you with all of those things. And you should be asking those same things of any regulator uh, supplier. A lot of times uh, your gas companies are just going to send a regulator with the bottle um, which may be sufficient, but you do want to make sure that you're asking the right kind of questions. And then lastly, we don't put in connections at the beginning of the list because we can adapt the in connections to make sure that we're getting the right connections to your system. It's more important that we make sure we get you everything else right first, and then how can we mount that or connect to it. A quick overview, and this is just visual of some Swage Lock offerings. Like I mentioned before, we do full regulator assemblies. You can see here, it's got gauges, the CGA, a relief valve, a needle valve on the outlet, so you get your flow control. We can do mounting brackets, hoses to make your connections a little bit easier. You can mount that to the wall and then a hose to your cylinder. We have changeover regulators. If you have two cylinders, so your supply doesn't run out, you're operating off a of one, once it drops below a set pressure, then it switches over to the second cylinder so that you can change them out without, uh, without interrupting your process. Dome loaded regulators, higher pressure regulators, and then even process regulators for your uh, bigger experiments where maybe you're working with fuels or uh, combustion chambers and those kind of things. Again, just real quickly want to review, because if you take nothing else away from this, for safe regulator selection and operation, make sure you uh, check off your do's and don'ts. So don't use a regulator as shut off, always use an upstream shut off valve. Don't use a regulator to control flow, it controls pressure. Use downstream flow control. Don't select an off the shelf regulator or a used regulator, or if you do, make sure that you consult the regulator manufacturer, make sure it's getting you the performance and safe operation that you want to have. Don't expose the regulator to particulate before installation or after. Do always clean the system and use filters as needed. Don't pressurize the system quickly. Use a slow opening valve. Again, cylinders have those slow opening valves. Don't size a regulator by CV. 
do size regularity using flow curves. And like I said, sometimes those can be a little confusing if you're not looking at them every day, but please take a look at those and call us or your regulator manufacturer if you have questions. Do size your gauges correctly and do use compatible materials. So that's it. I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Uh, below is some contact information. That's my uh, name and title. Uh, and then just some general company information. If you have any questions, they can connect you with us either by calling the phone number or emailing info at georgia.swagelock.solutions. All right, questions? I know there's gotta be a few. I went through that pretty fast, but, uh, or I did a really good job of covering it, which I doubt that's the case. Some of our guys from our paper mill are saying that you did a great job. So, well, I appreciate that. We'll give it a minute or two. Again, my information or our information is on the screen there. You can uh, email us if you don't feel uh, like asking the question right now, or if you have uh, something that comes up in the future. Question in the Q and A. What if you have uh, to uh, let's see, what if you have to have shut off pressure where it doesn't creep up over time when deadheaded? You you need to maintain a uh, a pressure downstream of the regulator when it's shut off. Is that the question? Yeah. So what if you have to have shut off pressure? Uh, yeah. And that, he said yes. Okay. It doesn't okay. creep over time deadhead. So assuming your system doesn't have leaks, you can still shut off upstream of that regulator um, and avoid the creep issue, uh, assuming it's not leaking out downstream. Uh, if you are talking about a system where you just need to, to maintain a, a certain pressure rating, um, we could size a regulator that was operating near that lockup range uh, you would want to make sure you had a relief valve installed just in case you end up with that maximum pressure. But if, if you need to leave it on or you need to have it basically deadheaded, you can operate that. But, but we want to make sure there's some kind of relief or, or safety device to make sure we don't end up at that really high uh, header or cylinder pressure. Could you possibly use a back pressure regulator? You could use a, a back pressure regulator. Uh, back pressure regulators do also uh, experience the same effect or a similar effect uh, to creep, but they would just be venting to the atmosphere. So uh, you would have to have some way to maintain that pressure upstream, but yes, that would also work. And Mike is also asking, is there a different PRV design for this? A different PRV design for? Deadheading. For deadheading. Uh, the back pressure regulator, like I said, if you need a really precise uh, way of doing it acts as a PRV. If you need, um, you know, something which is for catastrophic failure, uh, that would be something we would want to look at um, for pressure relief safety valve. And there are different types. We do sell a proportional relief valve that is rated uh, in the European Union for uh, safety device, but it is not a code device. So we need to be real careful about selecting those as well. And Mike, if that didn't answer your question, please feel free to, to uh, reach out to us later on and we will try to get a better answer for you. Yep. All right. Well, if we, oh. Okay, thanks. Great seminar topics. Appreciate that. All righty. Well, if we have no more questions, again, feel free to reach out to us if something comes up in the future. Uh, it's a pleasure being here today, and uh, hopefully you guys got some good information out of this uh, so you can keep you and your um, associates safe. Thank you, guys. Uh, uh, I want you guys to have a great week, and I know Clemson will because they're like a 33-point favorite over FSU, so sorry to any of my FSU guys. <laughs>
thank you guys for and in, in, in for coming, and uh, look forward to another one of the safety seminars uh, early in the spring. You guys be right. safe out there, and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. All right. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.